gather into this room where we're going to start here. I can say officially hello now and welcome. Um, I'm really happy you were able to, to join me for this tour today of the CounterSelf exhibition. My name is Mona Philip, and I am uh, part of the curatorial team here at the Art Museum uh, and the curator of this exhibition. <laughs> Um, and I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. As a Romanian Jewish immigrant myself, um, I come with respect for this land and for the people who have always resided here and continue to do so on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and Inuit. So as an immigrant, um, through the work that I do as a curator, I really try to, to learn and to understand better the real history of this land of the people who have always lived here, and um, to also foster a spirit of responsibility and commitment to deepening relationships between nations. Um, so this spirit of respect and responsibility is also kind of the, the background of this exhibition. Um, while it was conceived partly in dialogue with the project that is taking place um, on our other location, just across the road here. I don't know if you had a chance to check it out. Maybe you are able to afterwards. Um, it's an exhibition called Conceptions of White, who is, uh, which was curated by uh, Lillian O'Brien Davis and John Hampton in collaboration with the Mackenzie Art Gallery and the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, I wanted to, to create more opportunity to think about identity in various ways through the project that I developed here. And it's an idea that you know, I've, I've been thinking about for, for a long time. It's um, you know, questions of identity and relationship to place um, have been prevalent in my work for, for quite a bit. Um, but I, I was really drawn to the work of artists who I noticed um, create particular strategies for, for examining identity and, and specifically these um, notions of the alter ego and characters. They all um, sort of identify parts of themselves that become um, you know, almost other embodiments through which they speak to the world about their lived experience and the way they position themselves within the Canadian context, within society more broadly. So the notion of the counter self um, is something that kind of took, um, took shape out of these different encounters with different artists. And it's a made up term, <laughs> of course, um, but it seemed to me to encapsulate this idea of um, of an alter ego that um, offers a counter narrative to dominant hegemonic um, ways of telling stories and about um, identity, about history, um, and becomes a counterpoint, a counteraction um, to these impositions that come from different external forces. Um, I mean, in a way, we all have many identities um, intersecting within ourselves. We're never, uni, you know, um, kind of unidimensional beings. Um, there's all these different histories and different influences, and we often deploy different aspects of ourselves in the relationships with the world around us. Um, and so these are really strategies that these artists have honed and, and refined to really speak to, speak to power, speak against oppression. Um, some really use these alter egos to claim visibility, to reclaim space, uh, to affirm their presence. Um, others, on the contrary, recede into sort of protective shelves and, and 
um, restrict visibility and, and require the viewer to make the effort to piece fragments together and, and narratives together um, with a sense of, of protectiveness and, and responsibility. Um, and they all uh, look at how different notions of identity, not just um, um, ethnical or racialized identities, but also gender identities, um, immigrant diasporic identities are formed. Um, and also looking to deepen relationships with the environment more globally, looking to the more than human world and, and um, understanding ourselves in, not just in relationship to the ecological world, but as part of it, as an integral part of it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more in depth about each artist, but these are kind of the, the guiding lines uh, of my inquiry as a curator. Um, we can start with Meryl McMaster, uh, whose work I thought was kind of um, illustrative of, of, um, of this um, contemplative journey that I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, to take you all through. Um, Meryl, um, of course, is, a, is an indigenous artist, Plains Cree, um, and um, also with a mixed heritage of European um, ancestry as well. Um, and she is really looking to reconcile these, this dual ancestry within the way she constructs her, her own world vision, so she, world view. She, um, she is specifically looking to connect the self to land, to time, to enter the experience of time within this, this territory. Um, there are the two notions that, um, that intersect in, in her upbringing um, are a notion of linear time uh, where you know, past, present, and future succeed each other, um, the sort of more European approach, um, and then the cyclical understanding of time um, that is more specific to, to indigenous nations. Um, and so she, she is seeking for these connections with ancestry and history in different key places um, where she is able to trace um, her own uh, genealogy and looking at how community life, spiritual life um, has impacted um, space and how space and landscape and the natural world has impacted in turn community life. Um, and so in each of these um, sites, she creates a new iteration of, of herself um, that is generated through this encounter with the land and its stories, uh, with ancestral stories that she learns and, um, and then kind of channels into this development of, um, of new embodiments of herself. And so often there are um, allusions to, to endangered species, like um, in the images in the other room, um, where you'll see her embodiment of, um, of a self that is kind of merging with the whooping crane, um, one of the, um, the two species of cranes native to, to North America that is also an endangered species. Um, so she's really asking for all of us to, to think more deeply about the land and, and to connect and to, to foster a spirit of responsibility um, in protecting and, and sustaining the world we're part of. Um, if you <laughs> turn around a little bit, um, Adrian Stimson is another indigenous artist in the show. Um, he is from um, the Siksika Nation, Blackfoot, um, and as opposed to, to Meryl, who always kind of rethinks her relationships and reinvents herself, um, Adrian has worked with um, these alter egos of his Buffalo Boy and the Shaman Exterminator, which are kind of linked and, and dual sides of um, of a, of a character persona that he's created. Um, he's worked with, the, with them for a really extensive period of time throughout his practice. So this is actually the most recent incarnation that he's created. Um, 
it's uh, their images that um, derive from a performance um, he presented at the Remy um, Museum in um, just a few, still a few months ago, for fairly recently, last year. Um, and they're actually shown for the first time. Um, and this is what he calls the newborn Buffalo Boy. It's a performance and new iteration of the character um, honoring the reappearance of buffaloes um, in the plains and celebrating that. So his, his persona of Buffalo Boy is a kind of mixture um, of different elements, uh, some that come from, uh, from Blackfoot culture, um, as Napi, the old man figure, um, of also, of course, the centrality of the buffalo in spirituality and survival of the Blackfoot nation. Um, he is channeling um, sort of the lingering spirit and power of the buffalo uh, who were slaughtered on the plains. Um, and then on sort of the counter side to that is Buffalo Bill, uh, you know, a, a colonial character, uh, soldier, American soldier and showman and buffalo hunter um, who was part of these um, uh, sort of nostalgic um, shows that were meant to, to recreate um, um, these romantic uh, false ideas about um, you know, how the West was conquered and um, all the frontier adventures. Um, and Adrian, of course, turns that on its head and counteracts the whole nostalgia for that kind of, uh, of thinking, uh, foregrounding um, indigenous spirituality and storytelling uh, and taking over those stereotypes um, and making them his own. Um, also combining them with, um, with historical queer drag um, and creating this completely irreverent persona that, uh, that challenges um, colonial notions and stories um, and asserts the truth about, about what happened. Um, in this history. So you'll see as we continue to move into the other rooms that I've also included um, images of earlier performances of him as, as Buffalo Boy and uh, the Shaman Exterminator, um, just to see kind of the different stages and moments where he's invoked these characters um, in order to, um, to put forward the narratives that he's bringing back to light. Um, Stacy Tyrell, I'm, I'm just making you turn around a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> you're doing your steps now. <laughs> so Stacy Tyrell um, is an artist um, who is actually uh, from Toronto, but currently lives in, in New York. Um, she is also um, of biracial ancestry. Um, Caribbean and European. And so she is really challenging notions of, of racialized bodies and, and constructions of race um, and sort of the, this pervasive um, illusion of whiteness um, that was created um, to serve a lot of political, social, economical uh, purposes in history. Um, and of course, the other exhibition on, in the other side talks a lot about the development of, of this notion. Um, and so it's interesting to see um, Stacy's work in relationship to, um, to the histories discussed in that show. Um, in this series um, that she titled Pour la Victoire, so for victory, um, she is reinterpreting um, by using her own body these iconic, emblematic images um, that often empires, especially, but you know, different nations that kind of uh, pursue a very nationalistic idea of nationhood um, create. So they're, they're these emblematic figures that are the symbols of the state, of the nation. Um, I've, she has a more extensive series, but I kind of chose um, the one, the figures that were relevant to a Turtle Island, North American history. Um, so you have, you know, Colombia, 
Canada, Hispania, Marianne, which is the representation of France, um, and Britannia. So they're all Stacy uh, wearing makeup um, and kind of concealing her own complexion and the visibility of, of her biracial um, background and substituting herself to these idealized visions of, of whiteness uh, in, you know, embodying these nations. Um, and in doing so, kind of subverting that whole idea. Um, it's really curious how all these powerful entities um, choose to represent themselves as these kind of vulnerable women, you know, very virginal and beautiful and dainty and, uh, you know, it's a very superior kind of attitude um, that are, you know, can offer maternal love, but they also need to be protected. So they're protective, but vulnerable. And, you know, they're meant to rally the masses in support and, you know, to pick up the arms and uh, go for victory. Um, and, you know, some may, uh, may start in revolution, like Marianne's representation, which was first, you know, on the barricades um, in the in the um, uh, revolution, taking down the Bastille and and um, asserting rights for uh, for um, against the monarchy. Um, but then, of course, they become identified to colonial power. Um, and you know, coming from um, from a family that grew up in the Caribbean, um, and then tried to immigrate to England, there's also that duality between being taught a certain way of of relating to the empire as this protective, benevolent, uh, you know, white savior kind of entity. Um, and then when trying to immigrate, being told, no, you're, you don't belong here. Um, so there are all these um, duplicitous <clears throat> double narratives that, um, that she's trying to, to bring out for, for discussion and, and to kind of reveal with her work. Um, we'll talk more also about the, her other piece that is in the other room, but perhaps <clears throat> for just easier movement, it's. I'll just go room by room. <laughs> um, so we, we also have the work of Julius Ponsolet Manapul, who is a Philippine X Ilocano queer artist. Um, their work really looks at um, constructions of identity in diaspora, um, sort of between um, an indigenous identity counteracting colonial power and influence, but also as a queer uh, body trying to, to deconstruct and reject um, heteronormative um, or actually homonormative um, impositions on especially the Asian body, queer body. Um, and if you look into the details that these images are constructed from, um, the details of, of patterns and designs, um, you'll see actually products, images of products um, advertising um, skin whitening. So all these notions imposed on the queer body of expectations of, of beauty and, and, um, and image. Um, so the, the title itself references back to, uh, to these notions, whitewash bakla in the presence of the rice queen. Um, bakla is the word for, for queer in, in um, Tagalog. And um, the, the characters that, um, that Julius is embodying are sort of the two counterparts um, in Philippine culture. Um, one is sort of um, echoing um, the domination of the Spanish rule and taking on the, the garments of, of Spanish uh, royalty, um, while the two flanking characters um, are representing indigenous garments and, and indigenous bodies. Um, and so 
there's that duality of, of finding themselves between, in between these ancestral spaces and colonial spaces, uh, which also, of course, translates in diaspora here um, as an immigrant to Canada. Um, and all the garments themselves are kind of subversively constructed out of designs, cutouts made in the shape of, um, of a butterfly that is indigenous to the Philippines. Um, and, but the butterflies and these shapes themselves are furthermore <laughs> subverted by being made out of um, images um, cut out from images of, of gay porn. Um, so there's many layers of, of dealing you know, with an investigation of, of the self from all these different perspectives. Um, Julius is actually um, related ancestrally. One of, one of, his, uh, of their um, forebearers is Maria Josefa Gabriela Carino de Silang. I had to note that down. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, who is one of the first uh, revolutionary figures and, of course, a woman uh, fighter. Uh, against the Spanish rule uh, during the colonization period of the Philippines. Um, so they are, they are channeling that energy in terms of confronting royalty um, and this domination. So if you want to follow into the other room, um, I should say also that if there's questions that come up as we go along, please feel free to to interrupt me and, and ask. Um, please be careful also in this room with the, with the floor piece, which is quite fragile, um, as it's burnt wood. Um, you can see, of course, the other images of Meryl McMaster's work um, that I, I alluded to from the other room. Um, and of course, her, her series are quite extensive and, and take us to many different places. Um, but I chose these particular works in a way because of, because of the way I chose all of the works in order to speak to each other. Um, and so I was interested in how different motifs actually um, circulate from, from one artist's work into the other. So the buffalo, of course, um, connects to, to Adrian's work, um, and you'll also see that um, the image of the whooping crane, um, it's from Spirit Sands in Manitoba, where um, one of the performances of Adrian's Buffalo Boy takes place um, as well. So you'll recognize the landscape. There aren't that many deserts in Canada um, and sand dunes. So I, and of course, the Arctic, which then connects to, to Lakuluk and Jamie's work. So maybe we should start with, with their work. Um, Lakuluk Williamson Bathory, who is an Inuk artist, um, and Jamie Griffith, um, who is an artist of English heritage. Um, they both live and, and work in Iqaluit, and they, they often collaborate, um, even though they each have um, individual artistic practices. Um, Jamie um, has created a kind of device that, that she uses in order to engage with the fraught um, history that is connected to her ancestry. Um, so she created the character of the white liar, uh, which says it all <laughs> in the name, um, basically looking at all the, you know, the, the negative impact and oppressive impact that uh, her ancestors uh, have had on, on Nunavut and more broadly Turtle Island. Um, and so um, in this particular um, collaborative work, she embodies um, Sir Martin Frobisher, who was a, an English explorer from uh, the time of Elizabeth I. Um, and Elizabeth I is embodied by Lakuluk, um, and they're both kind of creating these, this um, scene, very evocative scene, on the shore of um, an inlet to Frobisher Bay. 
um, which of course is named uh, after Martin Frobisher, who wasn't there for that very long, um, but that place actually had an Inuktitut name, um, Teisya Jarjak, uh, which means lake shaped like a lake, something like that. Um, and um, of course, the Inuit always knew these places by their Inuktitut name, um, but Europeans came and now um, the maps say different things. Um, Frobisher arrived there trying to um, find the, north, uh, the Northern Passage. Um, he tried to establish a colony. He tried to, to find riches to bring back. Um, he you know, is shown holding a narwhal tusk, um, which of course was an animal that the Inuit knew very well and were hunting and, and relying on for sustenance. Um, but he brought it back as this curiosity and, and claiming that it's this mysterious animal uh, which actually apparently generated the myth of, um, of the unicorn. Um, and then um, he also ended up bringing back, he thought he discovered gold and um, loaded his ships on the way back with I don't know how many tons of uh, what turned out to be useless rubble. Uh, it's now called fool's gold, um, at least something that bears a, <laughs> a better recognition of, of his name. Um, and it's actually horn blend, um, a, you know, a, a stone that is not um, valuable in that way. Um, and the piece that is actually here and you know, is shown in the image um, is actually a piece from those ships, from that original transport back to England. And it was repatriated um, by English-based, um, Bristol-based artists um, and gifted to the mayor of Iqaluit, um, kind of returning it home and, and signaling back to this whole history. Um, Lakuluk's embodiment of, of Elizabeth is actually um, deeply influenced by her own practice um, of this Greenlandic mask dance um, that is called Uayernerk. Um, Uayernerk. I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to try to pronounce uh, correctly. Um, and it's, um, it's a form of character generation as well. Each performer um, develops their own character and, and starts with developing their own mask. Um, and it's a form of, of theatrical kind of entertainment, but it's also deeply educational and it's meant to, you know, to, to talk about life and sexuality and the universe and, and kind of um, transmitting knowledge in a very, um, in your face, dramatic kind of way. Um, and Lakuluk practices that and, and she also kind of treated Elizabeth in that way um, using the white mask um, in reference to the way that she, that Elizabeth, you know, was using uh, the white makeup to promote this image of herself as the Virgin Queen. Um, and so, um, Furthermore, she also uses the colors um, uh, specific to um, wire neck um, practice, which are black and, and red in particular, black in uh, signifying uh, the unknown of the universe and the humility that we should practice in, in thinking about um, the immensity that, that we don't really know. Um, and then red is the color of sexuality of, of the female genitalia, um, which was um, kind of um, taken up in opposition to that whole idea of virginality that uh, European monarchs and you know and, um, have uh, this tendency to to promote. And you know again, it kind of references Stacy's. Um, it, it connects to to Stacy's approach of those kind of iconic images of virginal women representing the nation. Um, of course, Elizabeth was instrumental in, in naming 
um, you know, places like the southern Baffin Island as meta incognita, and so, you know, the unknown lands, um, unknown shore, um, and so, so promoting the doctrine of discovery that led to, um, you know, justifying this invasion and occupation of, uh, of European colonists of um, Nunavut and the rest of Turtle, I Turtle Island. Um, and so even if Martin Frobisher didn't end up staying there, there were other successive uh, waves of, of colonists arriving and continuing way in, you know, into more recent times uh, with American communities and colonies um, that actually took his name <laughs> again. Um, and so it's a history that's perpetuated today and that still maintains Inuit in, in um, a state of, um, um, of poverty and, and inequity in their own homes. So that is the kind of history that, that Lakuluk and Jamie are pointing out to and, and bringing to light and, and, um, and fighting against, um, ultimately through their, through their um, image making, through their art making, and their activism as well. Um, we can talk also a little bit about um, Stacy's um, other work in, in the show. So this is again Stacy Tyrell. Um, and in this work, um, again, it's, it's, uh, you, she's using her own body, her own uh, physical appearance, uh, transforming herself through makeup and costume. Um, and um, she is referencing a historical painting from the 18th century um, by a Scottish, it's attributed to a Scottish painter named David Martin. Um, and it portrays Dido Elizabeth Bell Lindsay on the right and Lady Elizabeth Murray on the left. Um, and they were two historical women, real, uh, real historical figures who, um, were brought up together, lived like sisters. They were actually cousins. Um, Dido Bell uh, was actually the daughter of um, a British naval, naval officer uh, stationed in the West Indies um, who had a, a daughter with an enslaved black woman. And she, he took her, uh, took his daughter back to England and um, sort of gave her into the care of an uncle who was a you know, sort of country nobleman. Um, and um, this um, Lord Murray uh, raised Dido um, alongside his own daughter, Elizabeth. Um, and so the painting actually, <coughs> which is, you know, Stacy's take on the painting is quite, it's slightly different. It, that's not how they are portrayed, but it is kind of interesting to see, you know, for the first time in, um, in this sort of tradition of arist uh, aristocratic uh, portrait paintings, um, a black woman being represented alongside um, a white woman, um, kind of referencing that they are the same social class and the same um, status. Um, but even so, there are sort of slight codes that you know, are still uh, creating a hierarchy. Um, Dido Bell is always kind of a little bit more in the background and uh, wearing clothing that um, kind of exoticize her presence. Um, and um, you know, even though they show that they're close together, they're, they're still a little bit of a difference signified. And um, in reading accounts about um, their life and, and how they were raised on, on that manner, um, they didn't quite enjoy the same <clears throat> status. Whenever there were um, guests or you know, this, at social events, um, Dido Bell was also always more in, you know, kind of hidden from view and um, had to, um, you know, to kind of conform to what the, um, the dominant social customs were at the time. Um, 
but in the end, she actually inherited um, the wealth of her um, um, uncle, and she was a rich heiress, and she was able to, to marry well and, and have um, a much better life than, than usual at that time. Um, so Stacy is, you know, is also looking at these histories and again, like how, um, how race is really a social construct and economical uh, reasoning and, and uh, questions of power are what determine this difference and, and creating difference uh, between people. Um, and you know, in bringing them really in the four plan together on the same level, she's, she's again counteracting um, those notions. Um, jumping then to uh, another artist in the show and another body of work, um, Sasha Shevchenko is um, actually a recent grad from, um, from OCAD. Um, and she is a um, Ukrainian immigrant to, to Canada. Um, and so she's kind of um, bringing up um, Ukrainian folklore and, and legends um, in creating a character that is, again, a form of alter ego. Um, she's named Liusterko, uh, which means little mirror. Um, and so she is a, a sort of reflection of, of Sasha herself, um, but also offers a kind of mirror to all of us. Um, and actually it was interesting to hear from um, a Ukrainian student who was here with another group that um, these little mirrors are used <clears throat> actually, especially now because of the war uh, about, you know, they're used to communicate, to signal with light, um, between people. Um, so there's an element of, again, of, of subversiveness, but also of um, um, kind of existing in between presence and absence, um, in between life and death. Um, it's a character that's sort of shielding from view. She's, she's shielding the loved ones, but she's also not offering herself in full visibility. Um, in terms of materials, you know, she's always connected to, to the land, to, to earth, to organic materials. Um, Sasha often uses wheat and soil, um, and in this case, this burnt wood um, that again references you know, all the, the burning and destruction that's, that's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, the, the way in which the body of, of Liusterko is created is through this crocheted and applique embroidery um, that is traditional um, in Ukrainian um, folk customs. Um, Sasha also kind of spins and, and dyes um, this yarn herself. Um, and um, the way that this installation works with the bottles and yarn, of course, it's creating an image of, of violence, of potential violence, of, of cocktail Molotov. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, it also references women's hair and the sense of, of connection and, and community um, in the way that um, these threads are, are interwoven and, um, and sort of supporting each other. Um, and so it, you know, it can reference uh, solidarity and, and community between women in many different cultures. Um, when we were installing, we were actually talking about, about Iran and um, the violence against women that continues there and, and has spread, of course, more broadly, um, and the resistance um, that people are, are um, gathering together against oppressive uh, powers, oppressive governments. So um, we can continue on. Um, the other instances of, of um, Adrian Stimson's Buffalo Boy and the Shaman Exterminator that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are actually in the collection of the Art Museum, the, the black and white series. Uh, we're very happy to have, to have them um, displayed actually 
in hard house uh, most of the time. Um, and if you if you take a look back, I love how all these buffaloes are kind of gathering together and also framing uh, Meryl McMaster's <laughs> character of the water buffalo at the, at the, at the end. Um, and then at the southern end, it's the work of Elio Eudoro, one of the two pieces in the show. Um, he is an, a Brazilian Canadian artist. Um, and um, he, his work examines um, sort of the, the pressures um, and impositions um, that are trying to restrict and control and label the body, especially the queer body. Um, and so what he's done with the, with the sort of two costumes that he's creating, um, the costume itself becomes a character and a stand-in. Um, they're meant, they're, they're these mental creations that um, he thought to, con to construct in order to free the body. So in creating a kind of protective layer, uh, a form of hiding, um, he's also allowing the body to just be whatever it is, to disappear, to not, to not have that pressure of visibility and um, of being a certain way. Um, I think this video is really beautifully effective in that way of uh, creating, you know, it, it's named um, an invisibility cloak, um, something that you know, I think we all dream of. <laughs> As kids, uh, but then you know, in his case, it, it becomes a much—it's a different kind of desire and urgency um, of um, just making oneself invisible in order to escape judgment and, and pressure. Um, the the sound that you can hear in the headphones um, is the music of Milton Nascimento, um, which is um, also a kind of um, um, statement about life, um, which is sort of the sound in the other piece um, that you'll hear um, in Portuguese. Um, the, the elements that create the mantle in, in the video are actually gathered from uh, friends and loved ones and family, um, creating sort of this protective layer for, for Elio um, himself. And you know, it's something that he, he's been thinking about in terms of how the fashion industry uh, creates these expectations of the body, uh, how social pressures also create expectations of a body to be defined in a certain way, male or female, um, you know, to be beautiful or thought of as not beautiful. Um, and so he's trying to create a garment that actually um, relinquishes all of these different connotations and associations um, with anything like a label or like a standardized uh, way of, of behaving in the world, um, anything related to class, gender, and, and all of that. Um, so if you want to step into this room, um, <clears throat> So Elio's other work here, um, which is also a mantle uh, from his series, but this one is, is, is named as armor um, against destiny um, and invokes the Moire, which were um, the Greek goddesses of destiny. Um, the ones, the, the three crones who are um, determining the fate of each human being. One spins the yarn, one holds the thread, and the last one cuts it, determining the moment of death. Um, so he's creating with this mantle a form of armor for, for himself um, to face Judgment Day. Um, there was a moment in which he was facing um, health issues and so kind of starting to be even more acutely aware of, of mortality and, and the fragility of the body. Um, 
And so he created this, um, again, gathering this time discarded sort of fast clothing. Again, you know, one of the pests of, on, on our environment. Um, and um, sort of recycling them into this, uh, this garment that is meant to, again, liberate the clothes from any kind of connotations, even though you, know, you can recognize some elements that are for different sports activities or for education ceremony, or um, you know, there's a cost for a broken leg. There, you know, there's different recognizable elements, but in the way they're used and, and assembled together, they don't, they're not functional in that way anymore. Um, so he's referencing with these two work quite a few different cultural um, things. So one of the references is um, another really famous Brazilian artist, Helio Oitichica, who um, created the parandole, um, which are wearable um, sort of sculptural garments. Um, back in the 70s, he, you know, he worked a lot with communities in the favelas and sort of the underground um, queer um, communities. And he created these, these garments for ceremony and procession and, and dance parties, basically, um, to bring people out into the streets and claim visibility and um, and be activated, uh, you know, the, the bodies themselves were activating um, these um, textile um, fabric um, costumes. Um, in, um, in, in Elio um, Eudoro's case, he basically allows the costume itself to activate the body in a different way to, you know, by protecting and hiding it. Um, the other artist that he's referencing is Artur Bispo da Rosario, um, who was um, a sort of intuitive artist um, who um, constructed a, also a, a beautiful ceremonial um, garment that he sew, sewed her, himself, um, again, for wearing um, for Judgment Day. So there's all these religious elements on one hand coming from a Catholic um, tradition, but also um, elements that come from um, the um, African-derived Yoruba-based um, religions of Orishas um, uh, that are kind of related to like the Cuban uh, Santoria, but, but uh, with their Brazilian specificity. Um, the beads, you know, he was telling me that some of these beads are, are some of the beads acquired through ceremony um, in practicing um, uh, within this religious framework. Um, so he's kind of bringing together all these amulets and, and protective talismans for, um, for the safety of the body and, and um, combating judgment. Uh, whether it's gods or other fellow humans. Um, in terms of social judgment, <laughs> uh, the work of, uh, of Tufik also addresses visibility in that way and how, um, how we consider and, and, um, and um, define difference and sort of other each other. Um, he's a... Um, um, an artist based in Montreal who was born in France and um, he's of uh, Moroccan origin. And um, he also, you know, his work is very much about identity within, specifically within the Quebecois context, but also bringing to it um, his lived experiences from, you know, the cultures that he's, he's known all his life, uh, French culture and, and Moroccan culture. Um, and so he created um, a number of different characters that are also recurrent, and he works with them, you know, he's been working for the past, um, I don't know, at least a decade, probably two by now, um, and 
they each have their own biography and, and life story, but also um, they interact with, you know, they're related to each other, friends, uh, family, uh, co-workers, and they all, he always situates them in compositions um, that are either sort of scenes of everyday life or um, sometimes he reinterprets historical paintings or you know, he references historical events. And so in this work, it's a kind of combination of things. Um, it's, it's one of the rare series of works in which only one of these characters is apparent. Um, this is Ludmila Mary, um, who is mm, his most mysterious character. Actually, her, her, we don't have a bio on her. We don't know where she comes from or uh, who she is, what she's doing. Uh, we only know what she looks like. And what she looks like is very important um, because Tufik chose um, in, in, in um, creating this character to bring together the two elements um, that are the most um, stereotyped and, and sort of uh, feared as, as difference um, ab about uh, Muslim religion and, and culture. And so she is a bearded woman who wears a hijab. Um, and so confronting society with this appearance, with these two elements fully embraced, um, is how he uh, confronts xenophobia and racism and, and anti-Muslim um, racism. Um, but she's also a very stylish uh, person who loves fashion and loves to, to take up space, uh, to be in the spotlight. Uh, so she's wearing a very stylish uh, leather hijab uh, and always high heels. Um, and this particular costume he designed for this um, series of works he's done in Matan, Quebec. Um, so in a very rural part of Quebec that's quite homogenous and haven't really seen many Middle Eastern uh, people around. Um, and so he's, you know, he's uh, wearing his, you know, his um, kind of constant elements of, of garment, but also uh, reinterpreting um, the garment of the Quebecois patriots, uh, which were um, the fighters in, uh, in the Lower Canada Rebellion against the English, and were identified primarily by this um, sort of uh, belt wrap, ceinture fléché, uh, that was woven with the French colors and, um, and worn um, by uh, the fighters who were, you know, um, a very um, kind of um, um, volunteer army, not a, you know, not a professional army of officers and, and all that. Um, so, in, you know, he created a, a series of banners that are um, based on the performance that he often does. Um, where he just simply walks silently through a space, or urban space, public space, and wearing a, an iPad on his chest um, that kind of flashes these questions and statements um, that relate to, um, to current uh, social issues. Um, and so the ones that we chose for, for the show, um, you know, one says, I remember your distance. Um, Je me souviens is, is something that is on all Quebec license plates. You've probably <laughs> seen it quite a bit. Um, and it does have that kind of um, reference to never forgetting the history of oppression within that context between, you know, of the fight between the two colonial powers, um, the English and the French, and, you know, the oppression related to language as well. Um, and then he's referencing the, you know, the chart of, of Quebec fears, which is about, you know, the, the kind of laws that are trying to, to restrict and impose, uh, um, you know, the relinquishing cultural uh, visible elements and um, kind of absorption within Quebeca Quebecois culture. Um, and then, you know, an expression that is really, uh, really wonderful and, you know, in, um, 
Quebec French, c'est ça qui est ça, puis c'est ça, uh, which is a kind of way of saying, well, it is what it is, and that's it. Um, and he's, you know, he's using that, you know, in, in terms of his own presence um, and in questioning, you know, who has the right to be, a, you know, to claim to be a Quebecer, uh, who is a patriot, who has the right to be there. Um, in the series of images that also accompany the same series, um, Ludmila Mary is kind of either, you know, she's in these sort of very um, um, isolated landscapes, um, and you can see it as, as seeking solitude or maybe, you know, feeling ostracized and, and rejected by society and seeking solace with nature. Um, in the work um, where she's on this rocky beach. Um, it's kind of, um, to fix motivation was kind of similar to Merrill McMaster's in terms of seeking connection to place and, and kind of a kind of humility and understanding, you know, all the time and, and history that has happened before um, his presence there. Uh, whereas Ludmila Mary is always this kind of flamboyant character that takes up space. Um, here she is kind of dwarfed by landscape and, and um, feeling that kind of humbleness in the um, grand scheme of things. Um, in, you know, in, in this image she's in a more kind of man-made landscape because these are rocks that that humans brought to the, the edge of the St. Lawrence River. Um, they weren't naturally there, so another kind of displacement that echoes her own displacement. And in this sort of foggy marina scene, she's kind of caught between these two boats, um, and the names of the boats are sort of um, interesting. Um, he, Tufik was talking about, you know, the La Belle Mère, which is the, uh, the mother-in-law, um, which is kind of a, another kind of pressuring, judgmental presence, uh, as, we, as we like to joke uh, about it. But then on the other side, um, Tante Carabine, um, is a kind of play on, on words in, in Quebec slang. Um, to call something carabiné, it's kind of to, to mean that it's explosive. It's, you know, carabine is a machine gun, so it comes from a, a connotation of violence. Um, and tent uh, means complexion. So it's, he's kind of using that to reference um, how his own skin would be viewed as, as a violent complexion in, you know, in Quebec in the Quebec context. Um, so, you know, there's, I think in, in all of these works, there are a lot of different layers to dig through um, and to understand. And um, something else that, that's quite interesting that I, I didn't mention before is that um, many of these artists actually uh, perform these characters. So they're, you know, they're, they don't necessarily just create Photographs. Photographs are often um, the result of performance, um, or you know, not necessarily just documentation of performance, but derived from this act of of performing um, these characters. And so, um, I hope that all these different connections become start to become more apparent. And uh, um, ultimately, I think. The idea that starts, you know, with the counter self and this notion of resistance and uh, refusal um, of oppression, <clears throat> of, of restrictions, of judgment, um, then you know, try to turn um, the conversation towards um, the notion of counterpart, of being a counterpart in um, a real dialogue where you know, the dialogue happens between equals, between people who acknowledge each other's histories and, and realities. Um, that's the ultimate goal. <laughs> so let me know if you have questions. Oh, I forgot. I forgot to talk about the sound and the, the video. I was so taken with, with the costume itself. But 
Um, it's interesting to mention, I mean, the video behind it's, it's of Lake Ontario um, in a foggy day, kind of like the one in Tufik's image, um, where heaven and earth are kind of one. <laughs> Um, and then the sound is Elio Eudoro himself reciting uh, a poem by Fernando Pessoa, uh, who is the most um, well-known, famous poet of Portuguese language. Uh, he was Portuguese, not Brazilian, um, but even in Brazil, he's, he's quite well-known. Um, and what's interesting about Pessoa, I mean, the, the, the poem, uh, Maritime Ode, is again very much a kind of existential uh, poem about life. Um, but Fernando Pessoa himself also wrote under many heteronyms. So he created also characters, versions of himself that had like whole oeuvre written. Um, so not just like a pen name because he wrote romance novels that he didn't want people to know about. Um, there are actually fully um, different types of, of writers that he developed over and sustained over many, many years. So again, another use of, of counter selves. <laughs> um, so I'll stop here. And if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to try to answer. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming today. <laughs> and take your time, and I'll be here for a while longer if you want to chat.